Good day and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, High Tech Compliance in the Digital Age. We are pleased to have four fantastic speakers today. Epstein Becker Green's Michelle Capeza, who is a member of the Employee Benefits Practice and co-leads the Technology, Media, and Telecommunications Strategic Industry Group. Nathaniel M. Weiser. Hello. Excuse the interruption. We will continue on with our speakers today. Um, Nathaniel, who is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice. Adam, who is a member of the Healthcare and Life Sciences Practice. And finally, Josh, who is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice and co-chairs the firm's ADA and Public Accommodations Group. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed in listen-only mode throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. Should the speakers be unable to reply to your questions during the allotted time today, they will follow up directly after the webinar. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the presentation, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the PowerPoint. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint material. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Michelle. Good afternoon. We are delighted that you could join us today for the webinar High Tech Compliance in the Digital Age. I'm Michelle Capeza, and as you know, our workplaces are evolving and becoming increasingly more complex to manage. With the rapid advancements in technology and the increased use of high tech systems in the workplace, one of the critical tasks for organization leaders is to assess your level of compliance with a myriad of laws that govern the flow of data and information through these systems, the protection of the data, the ability of your workers to access these systems, and even the ability of consumers to interact with your websites, as well as the level of your organization's preparedness to act when there is a breach or other violation. Our webinar program today is divided into four parts. First, my partners Adam Solander and Nathaniel Blasser will discuss the steps you can take to prevent employee data theft from your organization and legal protections for data and employee privacy. In part three, I'll discuss fiduciary responsibility in connection with handling of employee benefit plan data, address important thoughts to consider when selecting service providers, negotiating service agreements with third parties that receive, transmit, and store information regarding plan participants, as well as the importance of developing a fiduciary policy for your plan in connection with data security issues. In part four, my partner Josh Stein will discuss website accessibility issues, including a discussion on the background and sources of accessibility obligations under Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act and other laws, key litigations and settlements in this area, and the impact this has from an employment law perspective. As you can see, a lot of ground will be covered today in this webinar, and we encourage you to reach out to us to explore any of the topics we will discuss in further detail. I now turn to Nathaniel Glasser, who will take us through part one of the webinar. Hi, this is Nathaniel Glasser. We're going to start today with a topic that's been in the news quite a lot lately, and that's the discussion about digital data theft. Um, recently, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, online hackers uh, getting into companies' technical infrastructure and stealing uh, employment records and other uh, confidential information like trade secrets, personnel information, patient records, things of that nature. nature. But often, uh, digital data theft is committed by a rogue employee who has even more access to your systems than someone outside. I mean, think about how data that could cripple your organization or could lead to identity theft of any of your employees can be easily taken by an employee with access to, the, to your email accounts or um, saved to a thumb drive and just walked out the front door. So um, we're going to start with a discussion on the next slide about how to prevent employee data theft from happening in the first place. And in, in order to do that, uh, um, 
there are a number of things that you should have in place. Uh, if you enter into any employment agreements with your employees, especially those that have access, access to confidential, proprietary, or other sensitive data, you want to make sure that any of those, those agreements uh, provide you with the right to monitor their electronic presence on your network, and that includes the right to inspect any and all electronic devices that they have connected to the network, laptops, mobile phones, tablets, things of, things of that nature. More broadly, you want to make sure that you have the right technology policies that are in place to prevent data theft. And that would include a policy or multiple policies that regard Internet usage at work. So the use of computers and tablets to access servers and data, email usage, social media um, apparatuses, and um, in including personal devices like a, a bring your own device uh, to work policy. Those are very important um, because a lot of times these days, companies are allowing their employees to access company email and sometimes the servers from outside of the office through an iPhone, an iPad, um, or other uh, mobile phone. Uh, so the hallmarks of any of these policies are the right to monitor an employee's use of the internet, the, their email, and any access to company data. That is absolutely critical. Um, you all also want to make sure that you have the right data retention policy in place, something that conforms to the uh, applicable laws in any jurisdiction in which you operate. And it's important to have that in place because you want to be deleting information when possible and necessary so that any potential data breach will be limited and contained. And finally, have policies and procedures in place for new and departing employees. You want to make sure that new employees know uh, the, the uh, ground rules and that they uh, will be monitored in their electronic usage. And you want to make sure that departing employees return any confidential information and any electronic devices that they have. In addition, if you have these policies in place and these checklists in place, you, can, you know to give your IT notice of when somebody's onboarding, when somebody's leaving, so that they properly set up the electronic devices that are used by each employee and that they know how to handle the devices through, all the way up through decommissioning them when an employee departs. Now, to do any of this, of course, you have to have the right technology in place to protect the data. And my partner, Adam, is going to talk about that in just a minute, uh, but that's, that's crucial. Finally, the last two bullets on the slide, um, issuing periodic security reminders and disciplining employees for policy violations go hand in hand. It's just like having a proper new hire procedures in place. It's important to conduct periodic trainings of each of your employees so that they're aware of what they can and cannot do on the, on the network and what they can uh, take to use at home and what they have to return. And it's important to issue security reminders to everybody in, in the workplace. I mean, these things can be as simple as having a notice to employees on their login screen that reminds them each morning when they come into the office that uh, monitoring technology is in place. Um, or having a brief online security tutorial uh, that employees have to sign every few months in, in, in order to know that they're aware. And, and, and finally, uh, with bullet six there, if an employee does violate any of these policies, you want to meet out appropriate discipline each time a violation occurs so that it doesn't just become habit of employees to uh, take uh, confidential information outside of the workplace or uh, utilize it negligently and, and uh, without the proper safeguards. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Adam to talk about uh, technical, uh, the, the technical aspect of protecting uh, employee data. Wonderful. Thank you, Nathaniel, and thank you uh, all for joining. Uh, you know, one of the real growing areas of my practice, unfortunately, is this area where companies call us because an employee has taken data, is threatening to use it against the company, or the company is concerned that the employee is going to take this data and use it to compete against them. Uh, from a technical standpoint, there is stuff that companies can do, and the severity of what you want to do is really a business decision based on uh, sort of the company's idea of what the threats may be. 
But I have a couple of buckets of things here to think about as you're considering your employee monitoring and what you can do to prevent these types of attacks. Uh, the first is you have to eliminate the opportunity for these thefts to occur in a reasonable way. I don't want this to conflict with your business or your operations, but you do need to take some steps to eliminate the exfiltration of data from your environment. Uh, the first bullet here is employee monitoring software. This is something that is very much a controversial um, topic in the IT security world, but there are solutions out there that the employer can use that will monitor the employee and predict when they may be taking information or may be getting ready to take information. It's very sophisticated software that's out there right now. And the use of it is somewhat of a hot button issue. You certainly can use it in your organization and how you use it really is what draws uh, scrutiny. Uh, there's also just common sense things that should be in place. You should be filtering your email. You wanna make sure that you're scanning your email looking for those sensitive identifiers. For example, if you're worried about somebody stealing information from your environment for engaging in identity theft, you can use email filtering to search for nine-digit numbers that may be social security numbers. All of that is very easy. From an internal perspective, you wanna limit who has access to sensitive information. That should really be based on job classifications. So you wanna make sure that you have solid role-based access in place and that you're auditing access to those repositories of sensitive information. The role-based access is something that you should look at periodically. Uh, these things tend to grow. You know, individual employees may get access to a database for some single purpose and you give them that access. You wanna make sure that you're taking that access away at the end of the day. You know, Nathaniel talked about data destruction policy. This is one of the most important things you can do. This really narrows your threat surface. So if you don't need data for any sort of business purpose, get rid of it. There's no reason for it to be there. And finally, you know, we talk a lot about technical controls, but some of the most damaging breaches that we've come across recently have been paper. You know, companies store a lot of paper. It's outside of the information security uh, view a lot of times, and it's stuff that really needs to be addressed. You can get the same amount of information from a piece of paper that you can from a database. So it's important that you get rid of that paper or convert it to electronic files where you can monitor the security of it a little bit more tightly. You know, do stuff like lock down USB ports. Uh, most organizations, there's only a few people in the organization that would actually need the ability to plug in a USB. That's a very easy fix, and that's how most data gets out. Even if it isn't an employee doing it on purpose, you know, data gets on those USBs and those get lost. Uh, it's the number one source of lost data in the healthcare industry, for example. Uh, you know, if you have mobile devices, laptops, make sure those things are encrypted. That really, go, again, goes to loss. Um, you know, people save data all over the organization, and they save it in places they shouldn't have. Uh, you know, people, everyone always has their own system of completing the work. This is something you don't want as an organization. You don't want people saving information outside of where it is because then you're not protecting it appropriately and it's falling outside of your data classifications. So you want to really make sure that you're scanning your network and you're figuring out where your business processes are breaking down and people are implementing their own business processes. You know, we do a lot of these security breaches and when an employee theft happens, uh, the interviews typically go the same way, is the employees say, yeah, I can see how that can happen. You know, no one's really monitoring that. So the most important thing you can do is have a deterrent effect. You know, make sure you have cameras out there. Make sure that you're auditing people's computer. And, you know, you don't want information security to interfere with the business processes, but you also you want it to be something that employees are aware of so that they know somebody's not asleep at the wheel and that we can, you know, move forward and that we're monitoring to make sure that these thefts aren't occurring probably the most important thing to do. Moving on to the next slide. What do you do if you've learned that an employee has taken your confidential uh, information? Uh, this is unbelievably important to have a response plan. Any type of data breach, you should immediately investigate the nature and scope of that data breach and have a plan in place to really attack it. Know who the right people are to be in the room, the right vendors, et cetera. Make sure that all of that is in place ahead of time so you're not scrambling, because in a data breach situation, really time is, is your worst enemy. You want to be able to respond effectively and quickly. So make sure you have that response plan in place. Uh, engage your forensics review. So if you think somebody has taken information, you know, make sure that you are using appropriate methods to determine what information they took. You know, going on to the next letters, uh, the next piece where you send a letter to them, it's very difficult to do that if you don't really know what was taken. 
Uh, one piece of advice here is if you don't have that expertise in-house, hire it because you want to make sure that you're preserving evidence. Uh, the worst thing you can do is, you know, try to image a computer, do it ineffectively, and destroy evidence that you'll need to get that information back. And then it's really sort of exerting pressure on the person you think has taken uh, the information. Send that cease and desist letter. You know, a crime here has occurred. You know, contact the police. Uh, it's, a, it's really a legal decision as whether or not you contact the police before you make that first contact. Nathan will talk about that in a, in a little while. But go all the way up to filing a civil suit for injunctive relief. You have a lot of tools that you can bring to bear here, and don't be bashful about using them. That data will get out if you don't get it back. And if I could just emphasize a point that Adam just made, is it, timing is very important for all, in all of these cases. You know, in addition to the possibility of losing additional data if you wait too long or being unable to preserve the state of the infrastructure uh, when you image it, uh, you also lose leverage in court if you wait too long, if, you, if, you're, if you're hoping to get some injunctive relief. Um, and you, frankly, you, you potentially lose the trust of your employees uh, if, if you can't get to the bottom of it quickly and notify them soon of any potential breach to let them know that you are on top of the situation, you are handling it, um, and, and you're going to move forward quickly. So great. Moving on to the next slide, and I'll hand it back to you, Nathaniel. Um, another area in which we see a lot of this, um, particularly these days, is where employees uh, use what we call self-help, or they take documents um, on, their, on their exit from a company in order to support uh, a, a discrimination litigation or some other type of litigation. Um, if you find out that that's happened, there are a few things uh, that you can do. If, if a litigation has already started or is about to start, um, you can seek sanctions um, such as the dismissal of the complaint if an employee improperly took confidential documents. Um, and that's especially true um, if, if the employee is, is really has gone on a fishing expedition and taken things that aren't remotely related to the litigation. Certainly it's a fine line, but courts don't look kindly on plaintiffs taking from their employers. Uh, if they could have found the information through the regular discovery process, and especially if they're taking information that's completely unrelated to their claims. Uh, in addition, their uh, misappropriation of documents might be the basis for a TRO or some type of counterclaim for fraud or unclean hands or a, or a, or a similar tort um, if, if they've taken uh, documents in support of their litigation. And in addition, if a plaintiff's counsel has advised uh, his client or her client on taking documents from you, that, that counsel could be disqualified if the advice, as I said, goes too far and, and um, the, the plaintiff has gone on a fishing ex expedition for documents that really are outside the realm of the litigation. And outside of the, of the litigation, uh, you have the options that, that Adam just touched on. Um, if, it, if the plaintiff is a current employee, uh, certainly discipline that employee, consider termination, depending on the, uh, how egregious the nature of the conduct is. And depending on the type of documents that were taken, criminal claims might be pursued. Um, you might go, go to the uh, police and uh, raise issues of potential identity theft for you or your employees. And um, there's actually a, a, a state court, uh, New Jersey Supreme Court case that came out a couple of days ago where a former school board worker in New Jersey was accused of taking confidential records to support her discrimination and whistleblower lawsuit against the school district for which she worked, uh, State of New Jersey versus Savendra. And um, a motion was made to dismiss the indictment on, on grounds that the employee was simply taking those records to support her, litig uh, her employment litigation. And the court found that there was sufficient support for an indictment against that worker, um, which had accused her of official misconduct and theft by unlawful taking of public documents, and essentially said that it was inappropriate for the, the employee to take documents that she could have obtained during the regular course of discovery during her litigation and allow the indictment to go forward. So there are um, actions that can be taken criminally, and I think that's a lesson uh, in, the, in the civil realm as well, that em employees shouldn't be so emboldened to take uh, employers' confidential uh, business information, even if it's to support what they believe to be legitimate claims. And that should um, help employers enforce confidentiality provisions 
uh, going forward. So moving on to uh, part two of today's webinar, and I'll turn it back over to Adam. Great. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. That was really helpful. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, you know, we really want to talk about the legal protections that are out there uh, as it relates to the employee's data itself. Uh, you know, oftentimes we're brought into employers, you know, a compromise has occurred, and in many cases the employer didn't know the scope of the information that they were holding and the laws that they were subject to. So of course, you know, there was, there's a delta between what they were doing from a security standpoint and what they should have been doing to comply with those laws. There's sort of two big buckets of laws out there that will apply to almost every employer in the room. Uh, the first is state law, and state law protects what we call PII, or personally identifiable information. And what is subject to the various state laws, which nearly every state now has a law protecting uh, personally identifiable information, but it's usually any unencrypted information that has an identifier. So it's you know, a first name, last name, uh, et cetera, and that information is coupled with some other data element, you know, a social security number, medical information, account information, driver's license number, what have you. And it varies by state, but as an employer, you can see you would have a lot of this information, both for your customers and your employees. Then there's specific buckets of regulation. Uh, the two most common that are out there that will apply to almost every employer is HIPAA. And Many employers sort of miss the HIPAA bucket, but as a group health plan, you're considered a covered entity under HIPAA, and as a result, you need to have a compliance program in place. And HIPAA really relates to medical information. Uh, the FTC will also have some data privacy uh, rights out there from a federal standpoint, as it applies to your consumer information. So the information that you collect on your consumers will also be subject to uh, law. And why this really matters is that we've sort of seen a burgeoning area of lawsuits against employers. Uh, the first one came out, and really the one that's getting the most press right now, there are a few others out there. But in the Sony Pictures breach, uh, Sony was the victim of a very widely publicized data breach resulting from the interview where they, it was essentially a parody of the North Korean leader. Uh, in retaliation for that movie, uh, movie, movie it's been widely reported that North Korean hackers went after Sony, they destroyed part of their network, and they stole information as it related to 15,000 current and former Sony employees. So the Sony employees uh, are now suing uh, Sony under California, Virginia, and Colorado law, basically saying that Sony failed to implement appropriate security controls to protect their PII. Uh, this recently went through a motion to dismiss, and the court allowed the case to go through. It's somewhat surprising. Typically in these cases, uh, the courts have held that just the opportunity for identity theft to occur in the future is not enough to establish harm for a case. But in this case, they allowed the claims to move forward. What gets especially scary about this is they did sue under the California Medical Information Act. And that act is an act that has a nominal damages provision. So without having to meet that burden of showing harm, uh, by losing you know, California Medical Information Act information, which includes California medical information, there's a $1,000 nominal damages provision, which forms the basis of a lot of scary claims in California. But as you can see, uh, you know, depending on the number of people that would be affected by this, if there's a $1,000 nominal damages provision, that number can go up very quickly. We see a lot of other data breach cases citing State Consumer Protections Act, where you can get triple damages in certain, treble damages in certain situations. So it is something that employers really need to be cognizant of and look at the data that they hold uh, and make sure that they're implementing appropriate security controls. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I will turn it back to Nathaniel. And, um, as we talked about earlier, it's really important for you to have in place a policy that um, expressly permits you to monitor your employees' use of your network and employee email. But there are um, privacy rights that are granted to employees, um, and, and th th it's important to be uh, aware of those uh, to the extent that you do monitor. Uh, first, th th there are state laws, especially those for invasion of privacy, um, and this is particularly important when um, when you review or monitor a, a personal email account that um, an employee might be using uh, on your on your network. 
Um, there are certain states, such as New Jersey, that, that recognize a common law of right to privacy and, and um, that find that a, a, an individual has a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in communicating um, using their personal email account, even if it's accessed at work. So it's important to be aware of the state law obligations that you have. Um, there are whistlebl whistleblower protections, both on a federal and state level, for um, employees who uh, use uh, specific information that they believe supports a whistleblower claim, um, and that uh, they might have um, a right to, to go to the authorities with that information and report a, a potential fraud um, uh, to support their claims. Uh, you want to be cognizant of any contractual obligations that you've entered into with either an individual or a collective bargaining agreement um, with, a, with, with a union if you have a unionized workforce that might limit your right to monitor and review communications um, of, of either that individual or bargaining unit members, as the case may be. Um, certainly, uh, the NLRB has taken an aggressive position um, about the, the the monitoring um, and action uh, based on uh, people's use of um, personal email accounts um, at work. And, and finally, of course, for public employees, the Fourth Amendment's prohibit prohibition against unreasonable search and seizures applies. So um, it's, it's important to keep that in mind if you are a public employer. Of course, there, there is a Supreme Court case from 2010, um, City of Ontario versus Kwan, uh, that, that held that government employers may generally review workers' emails and texts if they have a reasonable work-related grounds to do so. So I think the bottom line for all of this is it, it's always best to have the protections of a work policy, workplace policy in place and to have a business reason for reviewing the emails or, or an Internet uh, browsing history or uh, just reviewing any electronic devices that an employee may use before you do so. And uh, with that, we'll move it to the next part of our uh, presentation. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, in this part, I'd like to explore the topic of fiduciary responsibilities and employee benefit plan data. If you're involved in employee benefit plan management or administration, you're aware there's a large volume of personal information regarding your employees and plan participants that is processed internally and shared with third-party administrators and service providers for these benefits. As Adam addressed earlier, there's a patchwork of rules under the state laws that define what is considered to be personally identifiable information. There's also varying rules for notification of a breach of such information in each jurisdiction. And a lot of the information that comprises the state law definitions are the types of information that can be used for identity theft. In many states, the definition of PII is being expanded to include various types of health information. So with the advancements in plan administration technology, online enrollments, electronic access to account information, and benefit plan transaction processing, this PII and data has become increasingly more vulnerable to attack as it travels through the employer and third-party systems. And as you know, earlier this year with the attack on Anthem's information technology system, which compromised the personal information of individuals under numerous health plans, including PII, bank account, income data, and social security numbers, it definitely raised questions of privacy and security under HIPAA and high tech, and there have been other similar attacks. So these cases remind us that in today's world, plan participant information, whether it's PII or PHI or retirement savings account information, is all vulnerable to theft. So as a first step, it's important to identify the types of information that you are collecting about your plan participants and to whom that information is transmitted and where it is stored. On the health plan side, as you know, we have the definition of protected health information and the use and disclosure of this PHI is governed by the HIPAA privacy rule. And for electronic PHI, which is transmitted by or stored in electronic media, is subject to the HIPAA security rules. And in this regard, it's also important to ensure that you have HIPAA privacy and security procedures that are up to date, that meet requirements such as those under high tech, that you have up to date business associate agreements, that you understand when PHI is being shared between the group health plan 
and the plan sponsor and how it's being handled, and that there's a clear understanding even when PHI might become electronic PHI and subject to different rules for such electronic PHI. There's also an increased focus on government audits of HIPAA compliance and administrators of group health plans as well as business associates must review and update as appropriate their policies, procedures, and other documentation that establish, describe, and support their HIPAA compliance efforts. So I thought I would just give you a quick list of the types of things you want to double check that you're up to date with such as the name and title of the group health plan's privacy official, security official, and contact person, that your notice of privacy practices are up to date with proof of timely and correct distribution, that you have uh, met the mandates with respect to individual rights to access PHI and EPHI and how they can amend that information and the accounting of such information the names and titles of your employees authorized to access this PHI and for what purpose, your breach notification procedures and any investigation of such breaches, any risk analyses or risk management assessments that have been done, contingency and backup plans, copies of all business associate agreements, any HIPAA complaints, evidence of your HIPAA training programs, all of these procedures, including the software and technology and any uh, hardware or firewalls or critical patches, encryption and decryption of the electronic PHI, if you haven't looked at your plan documents or HIPAA procedures in a while, it's definitely important you update them and perhaps conduct a self-audit of your level of compliance. In 2011, the Advisory Council on Employee Welfare and Pension Benefit Plans studied the importance of addressing privacy and security issues with respect to employee benefit plan administration. The Council examined concerns about potential breaches of the technological systems used in the employee benefit industry, the misuse of benefit data and PII, and the impact on all parties who share, access, store, maintain, and use PII including plan sponsors and fiduciaries, trustees, participants, plan administrators, CPAs, record keepers, investment advisors, and other service providers. And they recognize several potential areas of vulnerability, including theft of personal identities and other PII, theft of money from bank accounts, from investment funds and retirement accounts, unsecured, unencrypted data, outdated and low security passwords, hacking into plan administration and service provider and broker systems, email hoaxes designed to steal information, and stolen laptops or data hacked from public computers where participants logged into an account, perhaps at a hotel or public kiosk. And the council recommended that the Department of Labor provide guidance on the obligation of plan fiduciaries to secure this PII, as well as to develop educational materials. But to date, we don't have such guidance. With that backdrop, I want to move into further discussion regarding how to approach these issues from a fiduciary perspective. As you know, ERISA plan fiduciaries are charged with meeting a prudent standard when discharging their duties solely in the interest of the plan participants and beneficiaries. And among their various duties, they must follow plan terms, policies, and procedures in accordance with applicable law and must prudently select and monitor service providers and to those whom plan responsibilities are delegated. So there's limited guidance regarding how to protect this data. As I mentioned, there are guidelines under HIPAA high tech with respect to handling of PHI and EPHI. We also have rules about electronic disclosure of plan documents and materials and statements, but little guidance connecting the myriad of rules concerning the protections of this PII with benefit plan administration. So fiduciaries have to act not only prudently in protecting this information and responding to a breach of their plan participants' PHI or EPHI, but also must consider developing prudent policies and procedures with respect to the handling and transmission of all PII, participant data, and PHI in the regular course, as well as notification and remediation measures for the breaches of any of this information. So establishing an appropriate plan data and privacy and protection policy is going to be complicated because this area is evolving and questions regarding ERISA preemption and conflicts with state and federal data privacy laws are not yet definitively addressed. In addition, remediation of financial harm to a participant is difficult since the level of resulting financial injury may not be immediate or easily quantifiable. 
With federal cybersecurity legislation on the horizon, varying state laws, the scrutiny over financial institutions and their compliance with laws designed to protect PII, and the increasing importance on HIPAA and high-tech compliance in the wake of health plan data breaches, merely understanding the ambit of the risks of fiduciary obligations to protect against employee benefit plan participant data breaches presents a huge challenge. But as with other plan administration responsibilities, plan fiduciaries must establish and follow prudent practices and procedures for handling this information and securing it. And when it comes to prudent selection and monitoring of service providers that will handle this information, due diligence of their systems, data storage, and encryption security are all critical. And it's equally important to prudently delegate responsibilities to company personnel that will handle this information. So in order to get started, on this slide, I want to set forth the preliminary considerations that sponsors and fiduciaries should explore when preparing data privacy and protection policies with regard to employee benefit plans. And I will discuss each of these considerations in further detail on the remaining slides in this section. So obviously, you want to identify who are the fiduciaries handling the data and what is the chain of delegation of these duties from the sponsor to the board down to a committee or to other individuals. You want to take a look at your own internal data and system security and controls, and Adam and Nathaniel address that from an organizational level, and the same can apply here. You want to establish privacy and security due diligence protocols with regard to selecting and monitoring these service providers prudently and negotiating the service agreements. You want to prudently select and train employees who will handle this data. You want to make sure you have the appropriate data breach notification procedures. You want to consider developing educational communications for participants so they understand the things they could be subject to like email scams or, or hoaxes of that nature. You want to make sure your policies are operational and they can be followed and enforced. And you may also want to consider your insurance options. So who are the plan fiduciaries? And sometimes this is a complicated question, not even considering the data privacy angle, but many organizations have issues just getting a handle on their own plan governance. And this is something that has to be addressed, and you may want to uh, take another look at your plan governance procedures and maybe develop resolutions to delegate uh, duties properly through the organization from the sponsor to the board down to a committee and you may want to have a charter that uh, also goes into data privacy and security and who's responsible for overseeing that and reporting that back up. You know, boards of directors have other fiduciary obligations to an organization as a whole, and they must have an overall reporting system in place for cybersecurity threats and breaches on an organizational level. Uh, this is becoming an increasingly important area of corporate governance. So if you have board members that are also ERISA benefit plan fiduciaries, you can see that will complicate the lines of their duty even further. So as part of your efforts to consider data security issues and policies, again, go back, look at your plan governing structure, consider where, what points you need to revisit, update any charters for fiduciary committees, um, and understand who in the mix here as a fiduciary might be touching data and who could have responsibility if there is a breach. You also want to evaluate your internal data and system security and controls. You know, what types of plan administration is even being used? Do you have online enrollment? What other technologies are in place? Where is this data being stored? Are you using cloud service? Where does the data go? Do you know where it's being transmitted? Um, do you know if it's being stored uh, offshore and not even in the U.S.? Are you using secure files, um, encryption procedures? Um, are there specific laws in place that require you to store, transmit, retain, and destroy the data in a particular way? Um, is your computer and IT system up to date? And this may require you to sit down with your IT department or auditors and legal counsel to assess the overall level of security and controls with respect to your benefit plan administration. And this is going to get even more complicated as more technologies are introduced into the HR function. Uh, we see this coming with big data, of course. Um, and again, with the benefit plans, a lot of sensitive information about your employees in that regard. So once you take a 
please look at your own organization and your own governance structure. Think about who you're dealing with as third-party service providers. And you want to get some assurance that they also have similar controls in place within their organization. You need to ask the same questions. You want to ask them for their security certifications. Do they have audit reports to share with you of their service controls? Are they ISO certified? Can they share with you various SOC 1 and 2 reports? Um, are they using subcontractors and cloud vendors to store your data? Where is it being stored? Is it on site or is it in a remote location? Ask them for information regarding any vulnerability tests or penetration tests they may have conducted and your ability to undergo such tests or audits of their systems. You know, Adam Scholander and his group here at the firm uh, do these types of tests and, and you can engage them to assist in that regard. You also want to keep a record of this diligence effort and seek updates to their compliance certification, at least on an annual basis. This is part of fiduciary good practice, best practice due diligence. And of course, if there ever is a, a huge uh, breach or, or some sort of um, you know, large uh, theft or harm to your organization, you want to be in a defensible position to say, you know, we did everything we could to analyze this service provider, to assess the security, and we felt it was prudent to work with this service provider. And when you're negotiating your service provider agreements, you want to take these issues into mind. Um, you may need to speak with folks at your company who are in charge of negotiating service uh, provider agreements. It might not be even in the HR or legal area. There may be a procurement department, and they may not be looking at these contracts um, with a particular eye or a technical eye on some of these issues. You may have service provider agreements that are quite old. Maybe you haven't even uh, updated them in many, many years, and the service provider is already on to a new template with new customers. So you, would, you should take those out and take a look and see if you can speak with your service providers about updating it or getting um, some amendments to that contract. And you want to work in some terms for data privacy and security, you know, looking at indemnification, looking at limitation of liability. They may have capped their limitation of liability based on one year of your service provider fees. Well, that certainly would not be sufficient if there is a huge uh, data privacy and security issue. Uh, you also want to request from your service provider information about any insurance coverage that they may have. They often have cybersecurity insurance and any of their clients can obtain that coverage or be covered on that policy. So you want to ask them about that and you want to find out what the limitations are and how it works and have that written right into the contract. You also want to understand what if there was a breach, um, who is going to be responsible for that reporting and notification, how, how fast would they notify you, um, how will you get the word out at that point, how will you communicate it within your own organization, as well as respond to any media inquiries or any government inquiries. And again, you want to have provisions to see their audit reports, testing reports, and request your right to conduct those audits as well. Uh, with respect to your own employees, you want to continue that diligence effort. Uh, you should identify, somewhere from your HIPAA, privacy and security, you know, perhaps there should be someone um, who's also another data privacy and security official at the company and who can oversee um, what is happening in terms of these issues. And you want to prudently select these folks who will handle the participant data. You know, hopefully if they're employed at your company, they've undergone all the proper background checks and, and are in good standing with your company. Um, and so you want to prudently select who will be in charge of that. Um, ensure the personnel are also, also trained in security measures. You know, make sure they're aware of, of hoaxes and scams and Internet scams and email phishing um, and, and various other things that they shouldn't respond to, phony emails, um, make sure that they're using whatever procedures even a service provider has told them they have to use. Maybe there's an administration handbook that the service provider has given to you and said you may only communicate with us in a very strict way. 
using a secure file or encrypted data, do not email us through a regular email or what, what have you. Make sure those policies are being followed um, and, and they should be, be followed, but sometimes we, you get these huge handbooks from a service provider and, and maybe no one really has gone through it and adopted those procedures. So that's another important aspect of the secure um, security and controls you want to have in place. And then also perhaps run your own contingency plans. You know, if there were a breach, how would you um, handle that? How would it get reported and communicated up through the organization and to your employees? And again, you want to develop participant communications. You know, there's always this debate that participants have too many communications as it is. They're getting so much information about investment funds and QDIAs and their summary benefits coverage and safe harbor notices and just so many things. But I think this is another area, and this is what the ERISA Advisory Council advocated for, that you may just want to have a one or two pager reminder to your participants. Um, about data privacy and security and what they can do to be a part of this equation in protecting this information and updating their passwords, um, you know, monitoring their accounts regularly, um, not avoiding public computers and hotels or kiosks to check their 401k balance. You know, a lot of common sense things, but also always a very good reminder and also another example of your fiduciary uh, best practices. So again, you want to take the time, it's definitely a critical time in, in our history to make data privacy and security part of your uh, regular menu of issues um, to be on top of. And in this regard with benefit plans, fiduciary policy, again, take the time, brainstorm, get your organization together, figure out what are going to be the key points to address in your policy, figure out how to do a risk assessment, Review your plan documents and determine how to incorporate these issues uh, within your plan materials. Establish data breach investigation and notification procedures and retain records of any breach investigations and the steps taken uh, to remedy any such breach. Uh, and review your insurance policies. I mean, look at your fiduciary liability policy. You should have one and see if there's anything there that would cover such an incident or any allegation of a breach of responsibility for failing to um, be, on, be prudent in, on top of these issues, um, especially from a board perspective. If you have the board also acting as your plan fiduciary, you know, look at your other officer um, type insurance. Um, look at your fidelity bonds uh, in terms of any thefts from the plan. And consider the new cybersecurity uh, insurance that is coming to market and any interplay or, or any carve-outs that may be there for ERISA issues. And of course, watch the uh, changes in the law as they evolve and update the policy accordingly. I'd now like to turn over for our next segment to Josh Stein. Thanks, Michelle. And now I'm going to move us into a different type of high-tech issue and where our first presenters were focused on protecting access and making sure the wrong people couldn't get access to information that you make accessible or available online. I'm going to flip the coin and talk about making sure that information that is supposed to be accessible and available to the public are available to those individuals with disabilities in the context of website accessibility. It's a particularly good time to be having this conversation because in just about a month, on July 26th, the Americans with Disabilities Act will celebrate its 25th anniversary. And as the ADA turns 25, there's been an increasing focus on accessible technology issues generally and most specifically with respect to websites. So plaintiffs, advocacy groups, and government regulators have all made this a front burner issue. Before getting into the specifics about website accessibility, I first wanted to briefly go over a few background points on general accessibility obligations to make sure that everyone is on the same page with respect to the ADA. The ADA has three main sections, their titles. Uh, title I is what most people in HR are most accustomed to dealing with. That deals with uh, applications for employment and employees and might require granting reasonable accommodations for leave or a modified workstation. Title II deals with state and local governments and programs, and Title III governs places of public accommodation, and that's what our main focus will be today. 
Uh, it governs places of public accommodation, whether you own them, you operate them, you control them, you're the lessor or the lessee. And the liability here is joint and several liability. So even if you have a provision in a contract uh, between landlord and tenant or between a third party vendor in a procurement contract that says somebody has to comply with all laws and that includes accessibility, that's not going to get you out as a defendant in one of these matters. All it's going to do is help determine on the back end who pays for damages or modifications. Now what is a place of public accommodation? The statute contains an exceedingly long list of locations that span most common physical locations in almost all major industries. Retail, hospitality and lodging, sports and entertainment, academia, healthcare, and as you can see from these lists, many more. Now, when people think of Title III, they generally associate it with one or two things. Uh, they say it's either effectively no different than customer service, or they say it's an architectural code that's really about measurement, like how wide a door needs to be or the slope of a ramp. And those are both certainly key aspects of the practical application of Title III, but what you can't overlook and what the government will never let you overlook is the fact that at its core, Title III is a civil rights law. And it's a civil rights law that places an overarching umbrella obligation upon places of public accommodation. And this obligation is what's going to drive our website accessibility discussion today. And that's the fact that Title III guarantees individuals with disabilities full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, what have you, of a place of public accommodation. Now, the full and equal enjoyment umbrella is supported by a variety of additional prohibitions. You can't deny someone who's blind or deaf or such the opportunity to participate or enter your location. You can't have unequal benefits where someone with a disability only has access to certain goods and services. You can't segregate, so you can't allow for access that's accessible only at a sub-portion of your website or only at part of your store or part of your restaurant. And you can't discriminate against someone because they're related or have an association with someone with a disability. There are also additional uh, obligations that I'm going to skip over today, uh, but when you download the materials in a few days, just so you have a complete set, these are other types of civil rights provisions that enforce Title III of the ADA. And while we're going to focus today on federal law, always keep in mind that state human rights laws, local human rights laws, and local building codes often address accessibility as well. So let's focus to our main topic for uh, my time with you today, which is website accessibility. So the first thing that I generally get asked is, what on earth do you mean by website accessibility? What, is actually ta what are you talking about? So website accessibility is making sure that you've designed your public website in a way uh, via the coding and the web design, that individuals with disabilities can fully and equally enjoy the good services and content that you offer to people without disabilities. Now, while the definition of disability under the ADA is a term of art with all sorts of legalese that I'm not going to get into, for this discussion today, we're primarily focusing on individuals who are blind or have low vision, individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, individuals with mobility disabilities who can't easily use a mouse, or individuals with cognitive or learning disabilities that might require additional time to process information. And oftentimes, these individuals can purchase on their own at their own expense assistive technology, like a screen reader, that they load into their own laptop or desktop. And then when they use your website, if your website is coded correctly, it will read the website to them and allow them to enjoy all of the features the same way someone without a disability would. So the easiest example here is we can all see that there's an image on the screen right now that is a keyboard with one key in blue featuring the international symbol of accessibility. If this were a website and it were coded to be accessible and I put a screen reader software on, when we got to this part of the website, it would say image of keyboard with international symbol of accessibility. If it's not coded correctly, if there's not an alt attribute is the term, placed in the code, then when we get to this graphic, the screen reader will either say graphic, or it will say image, or it will read the URL or some sort of gibberish, and a person with a disability would have no idea what's going on. So the first question I get with respect to the law from clients about this area is, does federal law, as it's currently written, require my website to be accessible? So I'm going to jump to the bottom of the slide and give you the few instances where the answer is definitively yes right now. If you are a federal agency under Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, your websites need to be accessible. Now, people ask, what about individuals trying to enter into contracts with government agencies? Here, the law is such
such that the obligation is technically, from a legal point of view, on the government agency, but from a business point of view, they have every right and should be requiring anyone who enters into a contract with them to make any website that deals directly with the goods and services that are being provided as part of the contract with the government agency to be accessible under 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. And 508 is a antiquated set of guidelines that are currently in the process of being uh, updated by the government as we speak. If you're in the airline industry, the Air Carrier Access Act requires website accessibility currently. And if you take video that has been broadcast currently with captioning on television and put them onto your website, usually in the context of multimedia conglomerates, then the 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act places obligations. But for the rest of you who are generally places of public accommodation, the law is something that remains developing and really is under adjustment. Because as we've talked about briefly, uh, Title III prohibits public accommodation from discrimination and it requires full and equal enjoyment. What Title III does not do, as we saw, is expressly clarify whether or not a place of public accommodation is limited to a physical brick and mortar location or if it can apply more broadly to goods and services offered entirely in cyberspace. And currently, and we'll get into this in more detail in a moment, there is a clear split among district courts and some circuit courts as to what the law stands for here. So where do courts stand on Title III with respect to websites in general? So up until recently, most of the case law in this area talking about the application of Title III beyond a brick and mortar location wasn't actually addressing websites. It was actually more in the content of benefits. Um, and that law generally split into three categories. The first, which I call the strict construction group. They say places of public accommodation are limited to physical places, so Title III does not apply. This is what I call the Scalia, uh, for those of you who follow the Supreme Court of the group. They say, you know, think back to the two slides I showed you of places of public accommodation. They were all physical places. This constituent says, if Congress or DOJ wants places of public accommodation to mean more, then you need to amend the ADA or adopt new regulations. On the flip side are what I call the spirit of the law group. They say that the ADA at its heart was meant to enable individuals with disabilities to fully and equally enjoy and participate in society. And to meet that goal, the ADA has to be read broadly. You need to allow it to breathe and adapt and evolve as society and technology do. That when the law was first enacted in the early 90s, you couldn't possibly imagine that 25 years later, websites would have such a predominant and prevalent part of interacting with society. In fact, some could argue that you could never leave your house and you could shop and you could socialize and you could view sporting events and you could order food and clothing if you simply had website accessibility. The third group is the group that's developed most recently and really in the context of website accessibility, and that's the nexus courts. And they really split the baby. They say there needs to be some sort of relationship between the goods and services offered by a clearly uh, encapsulated brick and mortar location and the goods and services provided in an outside method, like a website. The nexus theory really stems from one of the earliest and what remains to be best known website accessibility decisions. And that's the National Federation for the Blind against Target, which took place in the Northern District of California in 2006. In that case, the National Federation for the Blind, which is one of the most uh, ad active and successful advocacy groups uh, among all of them at this point in the country, filed suit against both under Title III and California state laws saying that Target violated these laws because Target.com was inaccessible to individuals for the blind. And while there were a variety of allegations made, the main thrust was what I talked about earlier as my example for website accessibility. If I wanted to purchase my wife a black leather bag, I could see an image of that. But if I was someone who's blind, the website simply gave me numbers and gibberish. So Target made a motion to, uh, to dismiss with two main defenses. First and foremost, that their website is not a physical location and therefore it wasn't covered under federal or state law. And second, that even if it was, it provided all of the goods and services from its website in a variety of alternative methods, uh, mail, phone, in person. The court denied Target's motion to dismiss and the entirety of the decision effectively hung on one word and more specifically two letters. The court said that the Title III applied to the services of a place of public accommodation, not the services in a place of public accommodation. And therefore, if a nexus existed between the goods and services offered in the store and the website, then liability could exist. 
And the court said the Target's website provided store hours, coupons, the, abil uh, the ability to order goods that might have been sold out in the store in your location, and it was clearly integrated enough that liability extended. They didn't rule on whether or not alternative measures were sufficient because of the procedural posture of the case. Uh, and they didn't get into the state law uh, issue either because of the relationship between the violation of the ADA being a violation of the California state laws anyway. So having lost the motion to dismiss, Target settled. And as you can see, they paid $6 million in a class fund. They had to make their website accessible. They had to pay the NFB to conduct training. And they had to pay significant attorney's fees and costs. So what was the impact of the target decision uh, and settlement? Exactly what you'd expect. We saw a dramatic rise in the threats of litigation and litigation on this issue. We saw a large number of advocacy groups uh, negotiating or forcing and coercing cooperative agreements, and I use that term loosely. It's generally a lawyer's letter that says we want to help you and bring to uh, your attention the difficulty we're seeing with your website, and then if you reject their overtures, they'd go into you anyway. And we see a lot of action from the regulatory front as well. So since Target, the law hasn't really developed uh, in any radical way. But what we have seen over the last four years is an increase in the number of district court and a few circuit court decisions specifically addressing website accessibility. Most of the cases, not surprising because of where Target was, have emerged in the district courts in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and most of them still hang to the idea that you need some sort of relationship or nexus to a physical brick and mortar case for liability to attach. Uh, we see cases dismissed against Google, YouTube, MySpace, Facebook, and eBay under federal law, all because they're strictly cyber entities. Uh, the court in the eBay decision, though, did caveat that under state law, it was possible that liability would attach because of a broader definition of business establishment in California. Similarly, we saw this uh, about a year ago in the Redbox decision as well. However, this past spring in the district court in Vermont, which is within the Second Circuit, which is a spirit of the law circuit, the court went the other way. Uh, Scribd, which is an online service that provides access to books and magazines and such, made a motion to dismiss saying that they were purely cyber and therefore Title III liability shouldn't attach. And the district court in Vermont said no, that the language of Title III, which does have among the lists I shared with you earlier some reference to establishments, uh, the ADA's legislative history, which talks about a liberal and broad approach, and DOJ's interpretation of the ADA, which we'll talk about in a few moments, all suggested that a website offering goods and services to the public can be covered by Title III, even if there is no nexus to a brick and mortar location. And just to drive home the point that there is a legitimate circuit split here, and that the District of Vermont case isn't simply an isolated instance, I want to take a brief moment to talk about two cases that were brought almost at the exact same time versus the exact same defendant with the exact same allegations, one in the District Court of California and one in the District Court of Massachusetts that go exactly the opposite way. In June of 2012, the National Association for the Deaf sued Netflix. As you know, Netflix migrated from being a DVD rental uh, mail order system to being particularly a streaming video system. And while a large portion of the streaming videos they offered were captioned, about 20 to 30 percent of them at the time weren't. So the National Association for the Deaf sued saying that the website was inaccessible under Title III and state uh, law because individuals who were deaf didn't have full and equal enjoyment. So as you would expect based on Target, Netflix made a motion to dismiss. And the District of Massachusetts had wanted nothing to do with the motion. They denied the motion, and they went on a fairly lengthy diatribe as to why Title III could cover places that were purely cyber. They said uh, the spirit of the law concepts here, excluding businesses that sell services through the Internet uh, from the ADA, would run afoul of the purpose and severely frustrate Congress's intent. They talked about the difference between goods and services of public accommodations and in that we talked about in Target. And then they went on to say that if you actually looked at some of the definitions in business establishments in the ADA as existed, service establishments, places of exhibition or entertainment, rental establishments, arguably Netflix could be all of them. So Netflix settled this. They paid over $750,000 in attorney's fees. They paid another $40,000 to have the National Association for the Deaf baby system. And they had to bring the remaining 20 to 30% of their videos into compliance and add captioning. Take the exact same case in California, which we've discussed as either strict interpretation or nexus, depending on exactly where you are. 
And the district court for the Northern District of California dismisses the action against Netflix and says it's not a physical location and therefore under Ninth Circuit law, there's no liability under federal law. That decision went up to the Ninth Circuit, which you might ask why, given the fact that the actual remediations were taken care of in the settlement agreement, and the answer is obviously attorney's fees. Uh, but the Ninth Circuit in April of this year affirmed the lower court's decision saying that you need a connection between a place of public accommodation and the website for there to be liability. So the next big question I get is assume that my company is in a strict interpretation jurisdiction or one with no case law at all, or I'm purely in cyberspace. Are we to take it that we're purely in the clear? And while I wish I could say yes, the answer is unfortunately not necessarily. There's a good chance that even if you were to fight and win at the district court and win at the circuit court, by the time you were done and you'd spent a considerable amount of money on defense costs, it'll simply be a pyrrhic victory because the Department of Justice, who are the regulators for Title III of the ADA, take the very clear and decisive uh, position that Title III already applies to the website as written and no additional modifications to the statute are required to get there. Tom Perez, who's now with the Department of Labor, when he was back working with DOJ's Civil Rights Division, very clearly said companies that do not consider accessibility in their websites or product development will come to regret that decision because we intend to use every tool at our disposal to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to technology and the world that technology opens up. And as you can see below, this is a, a piece of rhetoric fairly fiery for that group that they repeated again and again over the past few years. Now, I mentioned that DOJ is pursuing, uh, I, I guess, let me go back for one second um, and ask here, uh, DOJ, the question is, you know, what are they doing here? And they're doing two things. Uh, one, they are moving forward very slowly with regulations. And the second is that they're pursuing and proceeding with enforcement action. So let me talk briefly about the rulemaking process. Five years ago, at the 20th anniversary of the ADA, DOJ indicated that they were going to promulgate regulations covering what are the obligations and what guidelines are required to be followed for public accommodation website accessibility. And generally, the intended scope was to be either websites of clearly covered places of public accommodation or a physical location uh, or a cyber location that if you reduced it to its physical location would clearly be covered. So the example would be Target's website is covered because it relates to the brick and mortar retail store. And then Amazon's website would be covered because if you reduced Amazon from purely cyberspace to brick and mortar, it's really no different than Target. Uh, there were hearings held throughout the fall and winter of 2010 and 2011. There were comments submitted. And ever since then, DOJ has indicated they're coming. The regs are coming. And up until about three or four weeks ago, everyone from the government side, advocates, those of us who practice on the public access side, all agreed that we expected these regulations, at least the notice of proposed rulemaking, to come out in advance of the 25th anniversary sometime this month or next month. Uh, but the regulatory agenda that indicates DOJ's actions recently changed to indicate that the public accommodation notice of proposed rulemaking has been delayed until April of 2016. Uh, when asked why is this the case, uh, DOJ has suggested as part of the rulemaking they have to estimate the cost and benefit of any sort of rulemaking endeavor they undertake, and they are having some difficulty, as you can imagine, memorializing what the expense of making you know, a large percentage of businesses in America have to turn their websites into accessible websites. The other thing that I mentioned was that they're pursuing enforcement. Uh, and it's not just DOJ. Advocacy groups are doing this. Private plaintiffs are doing this. State uh, regulators are doing this. And these agreements span across all major industries. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You can take a look at this when you download uh, the materials in a few days. But I just wanted to quickly show the prevalence of these issues by highlighting a variety of key uh, settlement agreements that we've seen in the website area. So here are partnerships or settlements with advocacy groups we see dating back almost 10 years, Amazon, Radio Shack, Rite Aid, Staples, Major League Baseball. Uh, they even went after the American Cancer Society, so not even other advocates for individuals with disabilities are outside of this. Ticketmaster, a variety of colleges and universities, uh, banks, uh, Square Inc., they make the little scanning devices, as you know, on mobile devices that allow you to read barcodes. Uh, then we look at uh, Safeway, healthcare in, in WellPoint, Voodoo, which is streaming, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we turn to plaintiff, we see Hotels.com, we see Expedia, and one of the things you notice in the settlements with plaintiffs, obviously, is the addition of attorney's fees. So $200,000 in fees, 
uh, back in 2009, which isn't hideous. You see the Charles Schwab agreement, those attorney's fees were kept confidential, so you can only imagine what those would be. And the Walt Disney Parks uh, settlements in 2013 had $1.4 million in attorney's fees in addition to making the websites accessible. Uh, moving to offices of the state attorney general, we see state regulators in New York and Massachusetts, which are both spirit of the law areas, pursuing website accessibility going back over 10 years. Um, I must warn you, uh, from my own practice without getting into specifics, I can tell you that over the last six months we've seen an explosion in the type of regulatory activity in New York State. That can come both from the Attorney General's Office and the State Commission on Human Rights. It can be uh, commenced on the basis of complaint, but we've also seen self-initiated uh, regulatory action taken against individuals uh, across the United States that have accessible technology issues. And then we look at DOJ, and I just want to really highlight three trends we've seen since DOJ has committed to website accessibility settlements in the last five years. Uh, the first is that formerly, in order to have a website accessibility obligation and a settlement get to you through DOJ, you effectively have had to do something else wrong first. You needed to show up because you didn't have a service animal policy, or because you were a hotel that didn't have sufficient accessible hotel rooms, or you were a theater or a stadium that didn't have accessible seating. If DOJ got you there for settlement discussions and were working on resolving those issues, they would generally at the end say, oh, as long as we have you, we looked at your website, it's inaccessible, and in order to settle on everything, you'll need to address this as part of the settlement. What we've now seen is that DOJ will go directly after companies with inaccessible websites. Second, it used to be that website accessibility was the extent, but we're seeing over the last year or so mobile applications being added to website accessibility obligations as well. Then the third trend is that initially, uh, what standards you had to meet for compliance with DOJ was really something that could be negotiated as a term of the agreement. If you came with clean hands, if you were doing other things that were cooperative and showed that you had addressed accessibility in other contexts, if you had attorneys that were well-versed in this area, you could also uh, often successfully negotiate a standard that was fairly de minimis or certainly less than DOJ originally was seeking. However, in more recent settlements, there is a clear direction that DOJ is going, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But you'll see here again, banks, uh, television shows, arenas, universities, museums, other financial institutions, Peapod, uh, a variety of states and localities, and uh, accessible education course platforms as well have all been hit. So I mentioned DOJ is pointing in one direction, and that brings me kind of the last piece on the public access side. And that's to say, okay, Josh, I've bought in that I'm concerned. I've bought in I have a risk. My company needs to do something about this. Is there a logical course of action and a best practice despite the ambiguity? And are there guidelines that we should be following? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. And in many ways, it mirrors sort of the best practices that Michelle talked about in talking about her fiduciary uh, obligation section. The first is you need to be educated on the issue. So the fact that you've sat through this webinar and that you'll have these materials puts you ahead of the curve for many of your contemporaries. Second, you need internal buy-in. You need an integration of the concept of accessibility throughout your corporate infrastructure. That doesn't mean just legal. It means procurement and third-party vendor relations. It means marketing. It means IT. All of those groups need to have some sort of education about website accessibility and accessible technology, and there needs to be a voice that speaks to and reviews issues with an eye towards that, much like the way 10 years ago uh, cybersecurity was a novel thing and people now fairly are accustomed to having to address some of this. Third, you should develop and, uh, develop and implement website accessibility policies, practices, and procedures, uh, standard forms to be used or contract language to be used with your vendors, especially your IT vendors. Then you need to train the appropriate parties in legal, in HR, in compliance, on, in IT, on how to deal with accessibility and technology. And the last piece is that you need to understand where you are. You need to talk to ITS, your vendors, and see maybe they've already addressed website accessibility. Maybe they have, but only to the antiquated 508 standards. Maybe they haven't yet, but you're about to redesign your website, and they're going to do it there, or the opportunity exists to let you do it there. Um, if you don't have any of that information, the next best thing to do is to conduct, um, most ideally under the protection of privilege, under the supervision of outside counsel, um, an audit of your website to determine if it's accessible. And that audit needs to be conducted in uh, two prongs, and it can't simply be automated. You need to do a user review, 
where you have someone who is adept at using assistive technology use that on your website and see what their experience is like. And then you need to have web programmers and designers on the back end look at the code to see if things are set up correctly. Now, the second part of the question is, okay, let's assume we're going to do that. Is there something that I can audit to? Is there something that I should be looking for? Uh, or is it just a waste of time until DOJ promulgates its rules? And thankfully, the answer is yes, there is. Uh, it's called the Worldwide Web Consortium's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are referred to as either WCAG or the WCAG uh, 2.0, which was their 2008 iteration. There are multiple levels of accessibility, A, AA, AAA, uh, generally, we suggest meeting the WCAG 2.0 A and AA requirements. And as you'll see in the DOT regs uh, that came out for the air carrier access that I mentioned, in the revised rehabilitation proposed rules that are there that I talked about earlier, uh, DOJ's settlement agreement, this is where everyone's meeting. It's where advocacy groups are saying they're comfortable. It's even uh, people on the business side of looked that all seem to feel that this is a relatively same way. And for those of you who are international, uh, the EU, Japan, Canada, their web, uh, Australia, their website accessibility standards all sort of mirror the WCAG as well. In the closing moments of my time, I just want to turn away from website accessibility in a public access context and talk about it as it relates to intranet and internal facing websites for your employees or external facing uh, websites for your applicants. So the question I generally get is, okay, I now understand everything you've talked about under Title III with respect to public access. Is it the same analysis for my intranet or the same analysis for my uh, relationship with online employment applications? And the answer is no, thankfully. Uh, as an employer, you have more flexibility. And the obligations really stem from both 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, which governs government contractors, and Title I of the ADA, which, as I mentioned earlier, requires you to provide uh, reasonable accommodations to your employees and applicants so that they can participate and perform the essential functions of their job and reap the benefits of employment. Title I also puts restraints on what information an employer can have about applicants, employees, and so forth throughout the process. Uh, so what Section 503 of the Rehab Act, when it was revised about a year and a half, two years ago, said, uh, first it dropped a footnote that said website accessibility at this point uh, should be following WCAG 2.0, but it was simply a recommendation and a footnote. It wasn't part of the actual meat of the re uh, revised regulations. But what they said was there needs to be a way for applicants to have accessible job applications. So if online applications are the only thing you offer, then you have to make that accessible and compliant with WCAG. If, on the other hand, you have a variety of ways to apply for a job, and those additional means outside the website are treated just as expeditiously, they're reviewed with the same level of care, they don't harm someone if they, suggest, if they submit via in-person or via uh, mail or email, um, and in no way is it so isolated that it is obvious that anyone who uses the non-electronic online uh, application has a disability, then you're fine. The concern, because of your inability to have as an employer certain medical information about someone, uh, both during the initial stage of the application before you make them a conditional job offer, and even when you have them as an employee, the concern is that if 99% of your applicants submit online, and the only people who don't submit online are clearly those individuals with disabilities, you're effectively forcing them to disclose their status as a person with a disability, and you can run afoul of the Rehab Act and the ADA. Now, if you talk about existing employees, so now I'm an employee and I need to have online access to the internet in order to perform my job, uh, the question is, you treat it the same way you treat any other reasonable accommodation request. So the question is, do you have to accommodate? Yes, if it's reasonable, you do, but do you have to necessarily make your website accessible? No, if there are other alternative means of providing access uh, to the employee to what they're looking for. And I used to have to go into a whole hypothetical about this, but the Second Circuit in May uh, issued a ruling on a case involving IBM, which kind of sums this up very nicely. So in that case, an employee uh, said that IBM had violated the ADA because it didn't give him access to a company intranet, which had a message board. And on the message board, employees could share information, technology tips, uh, innovations that they've seen via sharing online like YouTube or Vine type uh, electronic video posts. And this gentleman was deaf and said that because they weren't captioned, 
he needed to have everything captioned and all of the online material accessible in order to perform both the essential functions of his job and to reap all of the benefits of having this interaction with his other employees. IBM gave him a variety of other accommodations. They, at times, provided an interpreter if it was time sensitive to transcribe the videos for him in person, or they allowed for CART, which is uh, a real-time translation, almost like a court reporter providing captioning, or if it wasn't time sensitive, they provided transcripts within a few days. And Plaintiff was clearly aware of this because he actually ran the program which provided all of these services. And IBM's position was, you have access to effective, effective access to all of this, you can perform the essential functions of the job, and you can enjoy the perks and benefits. And the court ruled, uh, affirmed the decision on behalf of IBM saying that's right, and that's the way that the analysis goes. Now, there was another decision uh, that came out a few years ago, and I, mean, I apologize, I don't have the site in front of me, but in that case, a hotel employee required any managerial level employee in order to progress past a certain level, needed to master a certain online system that talked about budgets and managing rooms effectively, and it wasn't accessible to an employee who had a disability. And he sued and said, well, I can't get promoted. You've effectively put a glass ceiling on top of me because you're refusing to accommodate me and make this internal program accessible. And in that decision, the court said that's right. That is a violation because there was no other way for the person uh, to perform their job. So it's something that you have flexibility. There are other ways to explore it. It might be that making the internet accessible ultimately is what you choose to do, uh, but there's a lot more uh, flexibility and analysis that has to go into it than there is in the public access side. And that is, uh, with that, I believe we are concluding our session. We appreciate that we have covered uh, a great amount of ground today, and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, if there are questions, you should certainly feel free to continue to submit them. We've looked, and for now, uh, we seem like we've covered most of the questions that have come in, but we are happy to follow up the email. You can submit questions. We'll respond after the fact. Uh, and we appreciate everyone taking the time to join us. Kirsten? Yes, thank you all for joining us today. As a reminder, in approximately two to three business days, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. And as Josh mentioned, uh, should you continue to have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out directly to our speakers. Their contact information is up on the screen currently. Um, and with this, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you very much.